Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Tuesday, June 30th, 2015, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's a look at what's coming up tonight. Tonight, California Governor Brown has signed into law a bill that removes informed consent for vaccinations. And if you can think of some freedom that hasn't been banned and would like to celebrate this 4th of July, Salon now wants to ban fireworks, you know, for the environment. All that and more on tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. Well, California has passed the controversial vaccine bill SB277 into law. This is a controversial bill that will require pretty much every single child attending public and private school to be vaccinated. Now, uh, SB 277 strikes California's personal belief exemption for immunizations. It applies to public and private school and children enrolling in daycare. It's among the strictest vaccination guidelines in the country. They're still gonna be granting medical exemptions for children with serious health issues, but other unvaccinated children are going to need to be homeschooled. Now, uh, in his signing message, the governor wrote that the science is clear and vaccines dramatically protect children against a number of infectious and dangerous diseases. While it's true that no medical intervention is without risk, the evidence shows that immunization powerfully benefits and protects the community. So here he's he's basically admitting that, you know, bad things could happen, but the it outweighs the risks here. And it's kind of a different tune than what he was singing just a few years earlier in regards to another bill uh, that the nanny state was trying to pass, basically saying that children under the eight, age of 18 and their parents could be charged with a crime uh, for refusing to wear ski helmets. So I'm pretty sure the science is clear on protective headgear, but in that case, the governor had this to say. He said that he was concerned about the continuing and seemingly inexorable transfer of authority from parents to the state. And he said, I believe parents have the ability and responsibility to make good choices for their children. So where was that same logic when he decided to go ahead and pass SB 277? I guess parents no lo longer have the ability and responsibility to take care of their own children and make decisions for their own children. Um, you know, but I don't, I, I'm sure ski helmets don't have the same sort of funding uh, from Big Pharma here to go ahead and get SB 277 passed. Now, many people have been speaking out about SB 277 and the controversy of having mandatory vaccinations and not allowing any kind of exemptions for parents. Uh, this includes Robert F. Kennedy Jr., Dr. Brian Hooker, and Minister Tony Muhammad. Now, this trio held an emergency town hall meeting in Los Angeles, um, and they were basically there to deliver irrefutable evidence that there is a modern day Tuskegee experiment going on in the African American community. Now, unlike the Tuskegee experiment, the, the Tuskegee syphilis experiment that involved a really small cross section of adults, this new state sponsored experimentation is being imposed on an entire population of children. So we reported on this on InfoWars as well. You can get a lot of this information just by going to InfoWars.com but reported that African-Americans are at a greater risk and there are many higher incidences of autism after vaccination in the African-American community, specifically uh, with African-American men. So um, you can read this at jeffreyjackson.com. He goes on to cite all of these published articles uh, published in 2010 in the journal PLOS One, autism incidences were 25% higher within the African-American community in a 2014 Journal of Pediatrics, uh, they discovered that foreign-born black individuals living in the U.S. had a 76% greater risk of autism compared to U.S.-born whites. And the most severe form of autism, uh, where they're seeing autism with some form of mental retardation, foreign-born blacks, uh, their autism incidence was 163% greater than U.S.-born whites. And in U.S. born blacks, it was at least 52% greater than foreign born whites. So this pronounced effect was not seen in any other race category. In another study published in 2010 in the Journal of Toxicology, um, Environmental Health Part A, 
showed that African Americans were at a significantly greater risk of regressing into autism after receiving the thimerosal containing hepatitis B vaccine series as infants. And there are many other articles there. It goes on and on and on. Uh, so just many examples of autism related um, incidents after having a series of vaccinations as young children. But here is basically just an entire community of people that are at risk. It's not just the parents that are there concerned um, in that, but it's an entire community of people specifically shown to be suffering from these vaccines. But of course, this is the type of scientific evidence that is going to be suppressed. It's not really gonna be taken seriously. It'll be downplayed because black lives do matter, but not to big pharma and obviously not to Governor Jerry Brown. So the citizens there in California, their only hope now is to take this to the courts, try and get this decision overturned. Uh, but the courts there in California are very statist so they're probably not going to win, which means it's going to have to go all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court's decision will be unprecedented in this case. It will, it will set a precedent for the entire country. So this is very important to all of us to, to just keep vigilant and see where this goes and continue to remain vigilant and vocal about this. Now, coming up uh, later in the show, you're going to have a sneak peek of the Alex Jones radio show tomorrow. He is breaking down an in-depth report on this whole, the whole vaccines and the flag taken down and all that stuff. But basically what it boils down to is that right now the enemy is launching overdrive for full and total takeover. So that's coming up later in the show. But part of that takeover is this massive push to destroy America's icons, to destroy any part of our history that the tolerant mob finds offensive you know they it's the pc crowd politically correct and if they're offended by it it's gone this is actually cultural marxism now campaigners it's not just the confederate flag and it's not just you know the the wedding cakes that they want you to bake and things like that well now campaigners are demanding that that ex-fbi boss j edgar hoover's name is removed from the washington headquarters there uh, this is over claims that he persecuted gays. Now, this is a new documentary uh, being released this week about his war on gay people. And basically, they're documenting how Hoover went on a witch hunt. They have 360,000 documents on gay bureau workers that's been gathered over two decades. And it was the Sex Deviates program, and it focused on sex perverts in government service. So, I mean, it's always these ultra homophobes that turn out to be gay themselves because there have been rumors floating for years that J. Edgar Hoover was gay himself and that he liked to prance around in women's clothing and stuff like that. So Hoover's problem was that he just didn't own it because if he would have just owned it and said, you know, this is who I am, this is how I identify, then he could be a hero and his name could still be there on the FBI building, but no, he is going the way of the rest of the things that the tolerant mob does not like, and it's gonna get taken down now. But that's not all. The Oklahoma Supreme Court ruled today that a 10 commandments monument on the Oklahoma Capitol grounds is a religious symbol, and it must be removed because it violates the state's constitutional ban on using public property to benefit a religion. And obviously in this case, Christianity and, and the Jewish faith. So the original monument was smashed into pieces in October when someone drove a car across the Capitol lawn and crashed into it. So very, very tolerant people there, just crashing into monuments, burning things down, ignoring the historical impact that the Ten Commandments had on the creation of Western law, the foundation of that. Um, you know, but I guess perhaps Oklahoma didn't want to acquiesce to all of the requests. Uh, for these different religious sects to erect their own monuments there on the Capitol grounds, including a statue of Satan that they wanted to have, this statue of Satan where the kids could come around and sit on Satan's lap. So I guess they just bow down to that uh, intolerance or tolerance, whatever, and removed it all together. But look at this. <laughs> Here we have the ultimate symbol of freedom coming up, the 4th of July, celebrations on 4th of July, and Salon.com is reporting Salon can pretty much spin 
anything into having a racist or misogynist or homophobic or oppressive spin, anything that comes out, they can put this spin on it. And of course, wouldn't you know, 4th of July fireworks that you're gonna be enjoying, um, total buzzkill here from Salon. They're saying they're causing huge spikes in dangerous air pollution. So never mind the fact that we've been lighting fireworks for hundreds of years and we're still here and everything is fine, uh, but this is the point. First, it's going to be the American flag. Then they want to destroy the fireworks because you know now it's a matter of national security because Obama said that's the number one thing. Um, but these are the symbols of oppression according to the tolerance mob. And this is really, you know, we've said this for weeks now, this is all about getting us to fight amongst ourselves, fight about the things that really don't matter and, and not fight against the state and fight to protect our liberties and the things that really do matter. Literally fighting amongst ourselves, a brawl broke out yesterday on the South, Car uh, South Carolina State House over the Confederate flag. Uh, this fight broke out between pro-flag and anti-flag protesters. So we knew this was going to happen, um, you know, and this is what the Charleston shooter wanted to happen is this race war in South Carolina responded initially in such a noble way. Uh, but, you know, now, of course, we're seeing the little bubblings up across the surface of this, this race war that's trying to be uh, enforced here in these different groups. Um, and now we also are reporting about another group staging an American flag burning event over the 4th of July weekend. They're not satisfied with just taking down the Confederate flag. Now they want to burn the American flags. And their site says, we maintain unwaveringly that both the Confederate flag and the American flag are symbols of oppression. We must keep in mind that the Confederacy only lasted four years. In the years following the war, Jim Crow, segregation, and the extreme expansion of the prison industrial complex were all upheld by the United States of America, not the Confederacy. And now in the 21st century, foreign wars are fought in our name for capitalist imperialist interest. While at home, systemic racism is alive and well. And frankly, I, don't, I do not disagree with that statement. I don't disagree with that at all, but it's a flag. It is a, it's cloth, it's a symbol. You're not actually dismantling the state. You're not actually stopping the state from going out and, and sending the troops to war in our name for, to, to, for their corporate interests. You're not stopping that. All you're doing is burning flags and symbols. It's, it's the cultural Marxism of this political incorrectness, uh, things that people find offensive. We fight amongst ourselves and just like these little battles that don't really matter while all the bad things continue to go on. It's divide and conquer tactic. You're not dismantling the system. You're destroying icons. And do you wanna know who else does that? ISIS and the ever so tolerant KKK. These are people who destroy icons and burn flags or crosses and things like that. This whole divide and conquer, the KKK has announced that they're gonna be holding a rally now in South Carolina, it's a pro-Confederate flag rally on the South Carolina Capitol. That'll be coming up here in July. They say they're going to speak on slavery and then hold a ceremonial cross-lighting ceremony on private property. See, they're burning symbols too. So now we're going to have to ban the cross because the KKK likes to burn the cross because, you know, they're so tolerant. But again, it is about distraction from the real issues. Issues like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which no one is talking about. No one's talking about the fact that Obama just gladly signed his fast track authority on Monday and said, I really like signing these bills. We should do more of this, just with this cheeky smile on his face that he knows that he's signing RIP USA right there with that. Just one month before President Obama was declaring that the Confederate flag was a symbol of slavery, he quietly removed an anti-slavery provision from the TPP. Now, this provision bars countries that engage in slavery from being part of major trade deals with the U.S. So at the insistence of the White House, uh, the rep that was responsible for writing this provision was forced to modify the language to say that as long as a country is taking concrete steps 
toward reducing human trafficking and forced labor, it can be a part of the trade deal. So it's fine there, you know. Specifically, this was modified so that Malaysia, which is a major hub for human trafficking in Southeast Asia that has enslaved men, women, and children subjected to forced labor and sex trafficking, Obama wanted to alter the language so that Malaysia could be included in the TPP. So slavery, it's politically expedient in this case because it benefits the TPP. So total hypocrite there. And, and just like I said, it's like, worry about the flag. That's the symbol of slavery, not the Trans-Pacific Partnership that is literally going to enslave the globe. Don't focus on that. Don't worry about that. Now, black civil rights icon and former mayor of Atlanta, Andrew Young, is agreeing with all of this divide and conquer nonsense. Uh, he says the debate over the Confederate flag is a divisive non-issue, which completely distracts from the real problem. Just like the flag doesn't answer anything. Uh, I would never trade the flag for a single job. The problems we face don't have anything to do with the flag. The fact is that 93% of the black people killed are killed by other black people. So if black lives matter, let us start believing that we matter. And rather than focusing on this divisive symbol of the Confederate flag, Young is urging Americans to rally behind the message of unity and healing that the Charleston community really embraced in the aftermath of this month's shooting. Now, coming up after the break, John Bowne is going to have an in-depth report on the TPP and basically how it signals peasantry for all of us. Effective at midnight tonight, a whole bunch of gun owners are going to be, that could be felons. All right, so they shred the Constitution. We're going to shred their gun registration forms. Millions of New York gun owners refuse to register their firearms to comply with the draconian New York SAFE Act. So far, only 24,000 gun owners, many of them cops, registered their semi-automatic rifles with the state, meaning that the law has effectively been repealed through civil disobedience. I am amused at the pathetically low numbers of New Yorkers who registered their so-called assault rifles, New York State Rifle and Pistol Association President Tom King said. The number of individuals who registered their guns is 24,000, and many of these are law enforcement officials mandated to comply by their department. New York gun owners know it is flawed and they are not complying with it. I am confident that we will ultimately prevail in getting significant portions of the law overturned in the courts. The SAFE Act, which created a gun registry for semi-automatic weapons using detachable magazines, was practically ignored by both gun owners and sheriffs. Hello, my name is Aaron Weiss and I live in the town of Poughkeepsie. I'm a combat veteran of Iraq and I'm also a law enforcement officer. Courage is taking the right and true course of action, not the politically expedient one. And anyone who is proud of this law must also be proud of the Patriot Act, the TSA, imprisoning Japanese citizens in World War II, since all these actions were spurred on by emotional fear and rammed through in the name of public safety. Protesters against the law marked the April 15th registration deadline by destroying state registration cards. I scored my New York Safe Act uh, protest sign. It says at the bottom, get connected. It's got an email. It says, sign me up. It's from Scope and Oath Keepers down here. Team New York and Second Amendment. So I'm pretty excited to put this out in my yard. I am going to bet that this is not going to survive in my neighborhood, in my yard, intact, for probably more than a night or two. Erie County Sheriff Timothy B. Howard publicly said he wouldn't enforce the SAFE Act. The SAFE Act isn't the only example, but it's certainly one of the ones that, that points the most to the fact that our government isn't listening to the people, and we are the government. The Constitution is the law of the land, he stated. If you know it's a violation of the Constitution, how can you enforce it? Do you want law enforcement people that will say, I will do this because I'm told to do it, even if I know it's wrong? This is not designed to deal with inner city gun violence. It's designed to deal with this phenomenon that has been increasing in the United States, according to the FBI, which is of mentally unstable people going into public places and shooting up the place. Hey, wait a minute, I have FBI yeah. crime statistics okay. that come out a year late, 2011. 20 plus percent crime drop in the last nine years. Real violent crime because more guns means less crime. 
I don't need a document and I don't need another man to explain to me that I have the right to defend my gift of life and that there is an argument in America from Hillary Clinton from Barbara Boxer Diane Feinstein from a whole gaggle of numbnuts who would try to tell me they will dictate where how and if I can defend myself and I will not accept it. I am a free man. Don't tread on me. John Bound for Infowars.com. Did you know that only six corporations control 90% of what millions of Americans see, hear, and read every single day? It's the illusion of choice. Think about it. The mainstream media is owned by only a handful of mega corporations with vested interests. But on the other hand, the internet is an interconnected network of billions of sources. So you can research information for yourself from multiple sources, or you can blindly accept what you hear or read in the mainstream media, never questioning what you are being told. This gives you a false sense of reality. I mean, do you actually know what you think you know? Or have you been programmed to accept someone else's version of events? Think about it. This is Darren McBreen, and I want you to break the matrix at Infowars.com and PrisonPlanet.tv. And listen to The Alex Jones Show, because there's a war on in your mind. end result of the Trans-Pacific Partnership passed by a traitorous Congress Is any member wishing to change their vote? will be to reduce America to a third world wasteland on par with Mexico, where the median household income is $4,500. The idea behind the so-called trade agreement is to replace and expand NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, passed by the supposed liberal president, Bill Clinton. Robert E. Scott of the Economic Policy Institute said, NAFTA was supposed to create 200,000 new jobs through increased exports to Mexico, but by 2010, growing trade deficits with Mexico had eliminated 682,900 U.S. jobs, with job losses in every U.S. state and congressional district. NAFTA streamlined the process of moving manufacturing jobs from the United States to Mexico, and eventually China and now Vietnam where the monthly salary is around $150 per month. NAFTA resulted in the loss of around 5 million U.S. manufacturing jobs, and the TPP will dramatically increase the losses. 40 million more U.S. jobs could be sent offshore over the next two decades if the current trend deindustrializing America continues under TPP, notes Professor Alan Blinder of Princeton University. In addition to sending jobs offshore, the TPP will significantly decrease the wages of non-college degree workers. Robert E. Scott writes, That expanded trade with low-wage countries has reduced the annual wages of a typical worker by $1,800 per year. Given that there are roughly 100 million non-college educated workers in the U.S. economy, about 70% of the labor force, the scale of wage losses suffered by this group translates to roughly $180 billion. Reverend Bruce Wright of the President's Commission on Ending Homelessness says, The TPP's implications on the poor and working class of the United States are grave and serious. From information gathered thus far, it is known that the TPP would drive down wages even further. The corporate trade agreement will create a potentially dramatic increase in poverty, unemployment, and homelessness due to decreasing wages, further joblessness, and increased health costs. In September of 2013, CNS News reported, during the four years that marked President Barack Obama's first term in office, the real median income of American households dropped by $2,627, and the number of people in poverty increased by approximately 6,667,000. More than 50% of the population, 165 million of 308 million Americans, receive some sort of government assistance, and the number of Americans on welfare has increased from 97 million to 107 million since Obama took office. 
the number of Americans on food stamps has grown from 17 million in the year 2000 to more than 47 million today. The new corporate serfdom to impoverish humanity and consolidate wealth and power is part of a process designed to reinvent and modernize the feudal system of the Middle Ages. This neo-feudalism, now emerging, will not simply control Europe, but the entire world under the rule of a globalist corporocratic government. Steal trillions of dollars, ruin the lives of tens of millions of people by foreclosing on their homes, robbing them of everything you got. And you know what you get, Alex? You get dinner at the White House. It's great to have a friend in the White House that actually picks up the, the, the phone when you call. That's what you get. You, you don't do anything wrong, stay in line. We're gonna prosecute to the letter of the law because we're a neo-feudal society. As Daisy Luther notes, a return to this system is now emerging. From globalist trade agreements and corporate monopolization and ever-increasing government regulation, today's oligarchs are ushering in a return to serfdom. Agenda 21 is quietly working to round up the peasants and place them in cities with massive restrictions on their movement through public transportation that only goes to certain places. Agenda 21 is keeping the peasants on the estate. TPP is about the global elite not only owning everything, but also reducing humanity to a state of grinding poverty. John Bound for Infowars.com Well, it's crunch time for Greece as the IMF debt looms and their bailout is coming to an end. Puerto Rico has announced that they too are in the same position and a new chart is showing that the U.S. itself is on that same debt path. Now, this is a projection coming from the Congressional Budget Office and it's showing that a quarter century ago, Greek debt levels were roughly 75% of their economy. It's about equal to what the U.S. has now. As of 2014, Greek debt levels were about 177% of the national GDP. Well, in 25 years, U.S. debt levels are projected to reach 156% of the economy. That's what Greece had in 2012. We can see how that played out. Basically, if Congress leaves the federal budget on autopilot, debt levels will soar, and we are going to be experiencing a Greek-style meltdown of our own. So fantastic here as Obama continually says, oh, raising the debt level isn't going to increase the debt, you know, total double speak there. Now, author and journalist Nomi Prince was on the Alex Jones show today, and it reminded us that we actually have a really hard hitting interview with her from 2013. We interviewed her for Obama Deception 2, which we still haven't gotten around to putting out. Alex has promised we are going to release that film in its, entire, in its entirety, as well as a lot of the hard-hitting interviews that we have uh, there. But here we're going to play a little snippet from our interview with Nomi Prince, where she's basically discussing the hidden alliances uh, driving American power and how what we're witnessing in the economy today is just a part of that whole bankster's plan. Now, let me just give you a little background on Nomi Prince. She has worked as a managing director at Goldman Sachs. She was a senior managing director at Bear Stearns. Uh, she's worked as a senior strategist at Lehman Brothers, and she was an analyst at the Chase Manhattan Bank. She's well known for her book, All the President's Bankers, in which she explores over a century of the close relationships between 19 presidents and their bankers, and also her really famous whistleblower book, It Takes a Pillage, where uh, behind the bonuses, bailouts, and backroom deals from Washington to Wall Street. So she is the real deal. Check out her interview with Alex Jones on the Alex Jones radio show today on YouTube. Uh, but here is just a little snippet from her 2013 interview, Obama Deception 2, uh, where she's breaking down the hidden hands that are controlling the banking system. The world's private bankers have been able to do the major key bankers that run the largest global banks in the world that emanate from the United States have been able to act above the law to get legal structures to support them in that act, 
to not be elected by us and therefore not to be accountable to us as a population. They effectively control the global economy because they control the financial system. And today, more than any other time in history, the amounts that they control, the sheer volume of different kinds of securities, of derivatives, the speed at which money and those securities flits about the world is so much greater than it ever was historically that their power has also become that much greater. Since the Federal Reserve was created in 1913 and, and came into being in 1914 to give these bankers an additional um, flotation for their risky activities. That risk has taken 100 years to get to the point where it is so vast um, that, that it's able to really bring down not just individual countries like it has done in the past, but also the entire world economy. The way in which these bankers manipulate the system is through the alliances that they create with the individuals that run the governments. So we think we're electing people to jurisdict over populations. We, we go to vote for them, we go to polls, we, we discuss their different policies, but really these bankers don't care about any of that. The only thing they care about is to continue to operate in a way that's unregulated and unbothered by whatever government's in power. So they are indifferent um, to whether it's a democratic government or whether it's a republican government. They don't care. They will ally with whichever leader in whichever party they believe will most be out of their way so that they can consolidate their power. They have chosen a financial route to that influence and that power and that control over the world as opposed to a democratic route. They don't get elected. They get appointed. They don't have to vet their opinions in public. They get to work their way up the ladders of their banks, and it is warfare in those places in order to get the positions on top of their banks that are then on top of the financial world. And in that respect, they not only are above the law, they're, they're, they're really above the world. Because these bankers aren't elected, they're not in public positions, they just happen to control multinational financial firms that operate everywhere and can find the places in the world that have the most favorable tax regimes or regulatory regimes or won't trace the money or the profits that they're putting into those individual countries. They're able to operate expansively and at the same time behind the scenes of the global economy. And because they are not accountable to what's happening outside, because they consider themselves private institutions, even though they, they are multinational firms that supersede local nationalized governments, they're able to continue to operate above the law. Um, and, and not to really worry about whether that law is, is a legislative um, entity from one country or whether it is based on regulations that jurisdict over banking in another country or taxation or how derivatives are accounted for on their books because they can move themselves around. They have branches everywhere. Um, and since particularly uh, the late 1940s when the IMF and the World Bank were established, it's actually given them even more power because now they have a multinational force whereby the governments provide money to the multinational entities like the IMF and the World Bank, but it's the private banks that have to sell their bonds. So the private banks can tell an entity like the World Bank, I don't want you to give aid to this country unless they do these austerity measures because you know what? Our investors won't like the bonds that you create to give those people that loan and we're not going to be able to sell them. If we can't sell them, you can't help them. And that's literally the agreements that were made in the late 1940s when these entities were established. From there, the bankers have been able to operate not just their private institutions within a country, not just taking the deposits of the population, but they also take the international community's largesse to the rest of the world and manipulate it in such a way that they can control where money goes, particularly when there's an economic situation that is most undesirable to any individual country. They can go in and say, well, no, if this country doesn't do what they say, 
we're not going to be able to raise money for them. And in that way, they really control without being elected anywhere. As much as people may think it's the governments or the central banks or the multinational entities like the World Bank and the IMF running and making decisions about economies around the globe, it is really the private bankers because it is on their say-so that these entities operate. It is on their say-so that the World Bank might give out a loan to a particular developing country because if they don't want that loan to happen, they will say they can't sell the bonds associated with that loan and it won't happen. This has been going on since the late 40s and these entities were established. If you throw into that the fact that in more recent history, something like our Federal Reserve has seen fit to bloat its books by $3 trillion to sustain the last set of mega fraud and toxic asset creation that our private banks did in the last four or five years, you see how their power is subsidized by the governments and the multinationals and the central banks throughout the world. If you have so much power in play underneath, for example, J.P. Morgan Chase, you can do anything. You are already present anywhere, and you have the power to dictate what these governments do from an economic standpoint. These private bankers don't just act as a shadow government in the United States. They act as a global shadow government throughout the entire world. They don't have to be accountable to individual countries' laws because they can be anywhere. They don't have to worry about what might happen to major losses they might incur because some governments somewhere will support them. So though they are unelected, though they are unaccountable, because they operate in the manner they do in the places throughout the world that they can get to, they are effectively the world's unelected government. They are a global financial entity that is in control or substantially influences our economy every single day. Ladies and gentlemen, Alex Jones here with some of the clearest evidence ever that the bottom has now fallen out. We have now reached the event horizon, not just here, but all over the world. Tyranny is launching offensives on every front. David Knight uh, is going to be coming up, breaking more of this down. Again, I am your host, uh, Alex Jones. Incredible. Let me just mention the headlines I've got here. Ten Commandments statue must be removed from state capital, Oklahoma Supreme Court rules. Boom. Voting rights advocate gets win at Supreme Court. Illegals can basically vote. No proof of citizenship to be shown. And you have states issuing driver's license to anybody that wants them. It's on. California, uh, on the last day of June, the 30th, boom, governor signed SB 277 for forced inoculation, getting rid of the religious exemption. This is a war on religious beliefs, conscience, you name it. And then that dovetails with what we covered a lot yesterday. Obama removes TPP's anti-slavery clause, which is still going on in Dubai and other areas, then attacks Confederate flag as symbol of slavery, and Obama issues 19 classified directives changing laws passed by Congress. We're going to be going over all of this uh, here in just a moment. When you look at this, you can see that it's all being expanded so that we're hit with so much tyranny, we can't respond to it. It's a war on language, a war on communication. Just as three top comics have recently come out, Jerry Seinfeld and others, and said, political correctness is destroying language and the capability to even communicate. And these are liberals. His 13-year-old daughter, they said, hey, we're moving back to New York City so you can meet more boys and have more friends. She said, Girls and boys together is sexist. The word boys and girls is sexist. Brown bags are racist. Dig up Confederate generals. Get rid of their bodies. This is the insanity that we're facing. Now, now let's explain something. We have a separation of church and state, meaning the government cannot announce an official religion. But they've expanded that, violating the First Amendment that says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. They have expanded that ultra-massively and twisted it to say at your commencement, it's your free speech. You can read a poem of your 
uh, speaking, if you're the valedictorian or salutatorian, you could talk about how you love your mom or your dad, talk about how you love the principal, love the school, love track, love field, love football, love Harry Potter, love the moon goddess, or love Jesus Christ, or love Muhammad. But now they say, no, you specifically can't talk about Christianity or Judaism. Everything else is accepted. Everything else is okay. Well, now, first story. Ten Commandments statue must be removed from state capitol. Oklahoma Supreme Court rules. AP, Oklahoma Supreme Court said Ten Commandments monument. State capitol must be removed because it indirectly benefits the Jewish and Christian faith in violation of the state's constitution. The court ruled Tuesday that the Oklahoma Constitution bans using public property to benefit a religion, and the Ten Commandments are obviously religious in nature. You know what's on the top of most major capitals? It's called the Goddess of Columbia. You know, the capital structure itself goes back to Greece and Rome, and it was for temples to the goddess. It is abreast. The arched doorways, this is mainline history, are an entrance into the woman, and that law comes out of the goddess. These are temples. Are you going to ban those? Christmas trees are Germanic and Druid trees that were brought in uh, during the middle of winter to symbolize evergreen, and the greenness would come back in the cold of the winter. Are you going to ban Christmas trees? Everything has some religious connotation and connection. And this is a war on ideas that can be selectively enforced where anything can be removed. And it's very discriminatory. They allow the Druids and the Pagans and the neo-Pagan uh, groups, the Wiccans, to promote and to proselytize on basis. But they don't let Christians do it. There have been Texas cases and others where they find a little girl with a Bible in her, in her bag and they throw it away. Well, she's allowed to have a Bible or she's allowed to have the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe in her, uh, which is also a Christian allegory, uh, in her bag. This is the persecution of free speech going on and the ignorance of the public, where they're aware of every mindless, imagined racist uh, problem. And if you don't go along with Obamacare and gun control, you're racist as well. It's the new religion, but they're not aware of their basic freedoms. This is unprecedented. And it's all coming down with... Gay marriage. You know, marriage was an ancient institution in every culture about men and women coming together. If people want to have civil unions or states want to legalize it, that's their issue. But again, it becomes a diversion and a distraction and also an overwrite, a war ag against everything that was primal, everything that was basic, everything that makes a species. This is a globalist overwrite in their own words of culture and society, breaking us down past the individual where we can't stand up for each other. There's a war on fathers in all the media and all the culture, and that's ultimately a war on women. This is a destructive agenda, sold as neoliberalism to free when actually it is to enslave when all of our other basic freedoms are being taken. Illegals can get free welfare and have their babies for free, and they can vote, Supreme Court. And now... California a few years ago passed a law that parental consent doesn't matter now down to age 11. They could give kids $200 discount cards if they would say, I want to be inoculated. And then the school comes in and says, they make the decisions for your kid. The pedophiles also want to move it down to age 11 and say that they can give consent. Well, they can't because they're not grown up yet. Just like you can't say, well, your 11-year-old wanted me to give him a bottle of Jack Daniels. You're contributing to the delinquency of a minor. You don't have a right to push that on them. This is outsiders, the state, corporations, control freaks, wanting to run our children. California vaccinations bill, SB 277, signed by governor, becomes law. A California bill that removes all exemptions to vaccine requirements for school entry, and, and then it goes in through the system. This is unprecedented. A California bill that removes all exemptions to vaccine requirements for school entry except those medically indicated has just become law. After being passed through the Assembly on Thursday and the state Senate passed the same version, it's now been signed by Governor Jerry Brown into law. They want to make us take hundreds of vaccines. This is so precedent-setting. 
And now they know more and more doctors are coming out saying vaccines are dangerous. Don't give them to pregnant women and stuff like that. Read the inserts. So hospitals are ordering doctors and medical centers are ordering doctors that they aren't allowed to say vaccines are dangerous, taking control of medical decisions from you and your doctor. That's what Obamacare, that's really corporate screw you care is. And here's an example of that, KXAN, here in Austin, Texas, where InfoWars comes to you. Austin Regional Clinic won't accept unvaccinated children. Strengthening vaccination policy post-measles outbreak that killed no one. But they hyped it up. They have a secret vaccine fund. They've paid out to tens of thousands of people whose kids died. They keep that very quiet, though it's admitted. But no one dies from measles. The measles, mumps, and rubella shot admits it can give you type 1 diabetes. They claim it's genetic, but it can give you diabetes. The insert openly says that, give you all these other diseases, neurological disorders, you name it. And now they're going to intimidate you when you come in and your kid's already sick and you want to get health care, and they go, show us the records or we'll refuse care. Talk about do no harm. And now they're going to try to force it. This is a war on people's freedom. The answer is... Find the clinics, find the vaccine choice clinics in your area and support them. Fight them with your dollars and the free market. There is a full-out war against choice, a full-out war against freedom, a full-out war against sovereignty, a full-out war against cash. The global meltdown is coming, and they're getting it lined up to use it to bring in full control. And finally, Leanne McAdoo made this point on the nightly news. Jerry Brown. When SB 277 hits your desk, this is what he said when he was in office the last time in 2011. He's been in office three times. He's back in now. He said to California members of the state Senate on a bicycle helmet for kids. They wanted to put parents in jail if your kid didn't wear a bicycle helmet. He said, while I appreciate the value of wearing a ski helmet, I am concerned about the continuing and seemingly inexorable transfer of authority from parents to the state. Not every human problem deserves a law. I believe parents have the ability and responsibility to make good choices for their children. What changed now? The big vaccine makers came in. They literally pumped in hundreds of millions of dollars, not just here, but all over the world, Australia, countries in Europe. They're banning kids 11 years old playing in their backyards now. This is the end of parents. This is the end of freedom. This is the total takeover of society. And then that ties into what David Knight's going to come up and be talking about next here uh, on the radio transmission slash TV. Obama removes TPP's anti-slavery clause, then attacks Confederate flag as symbol of slavery. Unprecedented that they're going to say globally slavery is okay because it's bigger than ever, as Jakari Jackson broke down a few weeks ago in a report. And then that ties into his 19 classified directives that he signed a few days ago that are secret. Not only do they rule by executive fiat now, but what's in it is secret. So David Knight is going to be breaking that down as well. I've got pressing uh, corporate and family issues that are going to be handled today as we prepare a major launch on the television and more. But David Knight's coming up, and I'll be back live tomorrow. We're going to go to break. Stay with us. David Knight uh, coming up with the main transmission jam-packed. Call your friends and family. Tell them, tune in right now. This is the defense of the republic. This is the defense of humanity. We can say no. All other tyranny has fallen when the people resist. All that evil men and tyrants need to flourish is that good men and women do nothing. We'll be back. This is the Info War, the fight for human liberty worldwide.